Hello and welcome to episode 9 of our App Builder series. And what a lot we have done already. We're coming close to the end of our first 10 episodes, so don't forget to go back to the playlist and catch up with any episodes that you've missed. Today, the focus is going to be on app metadata, how we can read and edit it, and how that could be used in a recent projects feature that will help as we start to use the Fission app in daily work. But first, I wanted to just take an opportunity to mention that tomorrow is FineConf Day. We're very excited to be holding it in person here in Edinburgh, Scotland. If you can make it along, please do. There's still tickets available. And we're also going to be live streaming the afternoon, so you can join us online. If you check out the website at conf.find.io, you can see that we have got quite an event coming together for workshops, getting started, explorations of the toolkit, and then a lot of great presentations in the afternoon, and a chance to get to know the team at the end of the day for people who are attending in person. So hopefully you could join us there, and if not, the next time it may be somewhere a little bit closer to you. But now, on with our episode. I wanted to, like before, catch up on a couple of small changes since the last video. Actually, this time, there's not a huge amount of work being done. There was a bug fix um, in the save handling. It was noticed that the chain of logic wasn't quite right, um, but you could see in the commit history the change that was made there. The other thing I wanted to highlight was that I added a markdown editor. We're, just like before, looking for the MD extension, and this time we've moved it to make markdown instead of simply making a text document. As before, the make text function is called to set up the main entry, the editor. And then a little bit like the previous attempt at a um, code entry simulation, um, we're accessing that entry and setting it to monospace uh, and updating it to make that change. But more interestingly, we have a preview panel that is going to be using the rich text from Markdown helper and that's going to be displayed in a horizontal split alongside our editor. Using the onChanged function, we're also making sure that the preview is updated every time there is a change using this parse markdown function. And then, of course, we need to make sure that the system knows that the file is now made um, noted that it's edited. This dirty flag is what the onChanged for the entry was before, and we are just extend, extending it to hook in the parse markdown feature. So we can just quickly look at that in action. If I open a new terminal, run our project and use the example folder that we've been uh, testing it with before, you can see I added a readme file. And here we have markdown on the left and a preview on the right. So we could just go ahead and edit this. We could put in a second heading or a feature list. And all sorts of other things um, like uh, uh, italic. I couldn't remember how markdown italic worked there, uh, but there we go, it's italic and bold. And a lot of built-in markdown features are going to render just fine using the built-in functionality. So that was a handy little addition that just makes our editor a little bit richer. But now let's move on to the work for today, um, working with the project metadata. Now this is the fineapp.toml file that you can put into your project and the fine tools are going to recognize the contents so that you don't have to keep uh, remembering the command line parameters that are going to be set for any of the build for your application. First of all, I think that what we should do is go to our project creation code and make sure that when a new project is created, it has the appropriate metadata file. You'll see a very small refactoring here. I've made a create file um, helper function, and that just means that we can simply list the files and their contents in this create project method. Pretty straightforward and just makes it a little bit easier. So we can then just copy a chunk of code there for our new um, project creation and I will call this fineapp.toml. 
autumnal. And the content is pretty straightforward. Uh, we just want to have a details section. By default, um, there's not a lot that we need in here. Uh, let's take out those new lines. Um, and then the name of the project is um, pretty much all that we need. And we'll pass in here um, the project name that we know when the project's been created. And that name, sanitizing helper, is, is not really needed for this. We can, we, I think we can use the name just as is. And if there's an error, we'll return that out and the project creation is going to um, fail like before. So now we're creating this um, TOML file for our brand new project. Let's uh, put some code in to read it uh, and then we can then we can work with that. So I created an extra file just before this recording called meta.go in an internal app project, just really to help save a little bit of time. The fine app is an internal detail to the compiler tools actually. So we're just replicating it to be able to work locally in our project. As you can see, it has um, an app is the top level. It has websites, details, and more fields that we're not going to worry about right now. The details that I just created is represented by this struct here, and the name is the field that I have just added in our basic um, file. And I created a load and save function here. We are just using this um, Tommel library from Burnt Sushi, who does a lot of great libraries. Uh, we added that using go get, and here we're able to just use it, and the encoder and decoder just work with this um, data structure that we've defined on a reader or writer of the IO package. So all of that is taken care of for us. The next thing we need to do is actually open the metadata if we find it. So to do this, we're going to go back to our project code and see where we are opening the project. Well, it's here in this open project function. We're getting the name of the project from the directory, and then we're just setting that as the title for our user interface. So first of all, um, what we're going to want to do is update this code here to do more than just get the directory name. Let's set up a new um, constructor in that same app package. And that's going to return something more meaningful uh, from the directory that we are loading. So alongside this meta uh, file, we'll create another new one called uh, project.go. That is in the um, app package still. And this function, uh, new project, is taking in the listable URI and returning, actually, we don't know what it's returning, a structure of, of some kind. Uh, let's define a new one. Uh, I think there's gonna be a couple of interesting things that we'll want to operate on once a project type um, is more defined. For one thing, the name, but it will come to plenty more. So we want to create a new type called project structure and that's going to currently just embed the um, fine app uh, metadata and that's what we're going to work with at the moment so we can paste in the code from before and say that the name a fallback for the name is just the the name of the directory like we were doing before and in this case we're going to want to set up a new project um, structure so we can do that there. And um, uh, as this is a fallback, we could say that the meta.details.name is the name that we're, that we're using there as a little fallback. Uh, oh, I don't think we can do that, do that in line, sorry. So p.name, there we go. So that's the, the fallback set. Um, I suspect what we really want to do here is remember the directory as well. So uh, let's just pass that in. Mm. 
Okay, we can return the project, but of course what we really want to do is read the metadata. So uh, let's just see the data then would be, um, well, I suppose we, we want the URI um, to check. And so that's storage.child to get the name of a child inside an existing list or URI. So that would be uh, fine app.toml. Um, and there's technically an error in there. Uh, okay, let's check. So if um, the error is not nil, we could just return. Hey, we could even log that. Um, I don't think that's likely to be a problem. Log error. Um, so now we have the URI for it, we're going to want to um, load that uh, metadata. So the metadata and a possible error would be returned from load the data URI. And if that is an error, then we need to do something appropriate there. Um, I'm going to log that one too. It doesn't feel like anything that the user can do much about. Um, return p and just before we actually return then the metadata of p we can set it now with confidence to the metadata that we accessed and that will override the default that we set up earlier okay so that's the uh, project loaded from the listable location um, so if we save this it should figure out where the name that uh, the function came from and the name is now a project and we can set the name as the project metadata um, oh, metadata details name and now you can see we're pulling out the information from the find metadata which we have set the, the default for okay so that um, yeah, that should set the title from the properties. And so we could we could test that, but um, the project doesn't include metadata. So let's just clear out um, that example project and start again. Uh, oh, that's not quite right. We're going to need to start without a parameter. There we go, and create a new project. I will call it example again. And here we have now created uh, a new project. It has a toml file, the example name is set there, and it appears there in the header. So, so far so good, I think. Uh, we don't really have any file monitoring on this, but if I just save that text file, because we built those editors, then running it again, we'll see through opening that project there, that the title is example two and here, despite the folder name being example. So that is working correctly. And we can move on to the next step, um, which is to edit this application detail. What I thought would be really beneficial at this point would be to look at how the palettes are set up on the right hand side of our user interface. And if we look at the word settings, we have simply created this little right top um, as a placeholder that's set into the palette using a border container. I think that we can, at this point, set up a app tabs that will help us to have multiple palettes all at the same time. And so by doing that, we can have our app editor and we could still include the items that were previously there um, provided from the palette call in the editor type that we defined recently. But first, a costume change. The heating is turned way up in this building and now I think it's probably time for less jacket. Much better. So let's set up the tabs for our palette then. 
this will be container dot new app tabs and we can pass in tab items there in fact we probably will uh, we want to have this uh, app tab available all the time so let's pass in a new a new one there a new tab item that is going to be app and we will make that uh, app tab shortly um, and that we just need to call it there then the palette is actually not going to be a border container with multiple items in it we probably don't need an intermediate container at all we can just specify that the palette is now an app tabs we can manipulate that uh, appropriately so this then would be a container dot app tabs and there'll be a couple of small changes we need to make there <clears throat> the oh well firstly fix the syntax there and then when we're manipulating this palette we're adding the palettes from um, the editor that's open but we don't want uh, we don't want to take items from a container this is now this is now app tabs so uh, we have items in that's in in that app tabs and we're going to want to append all of the palette items that came from the editor there so we could just make this a little neater and append to the um, app um, just the first item in the in the item so that's the palette um, then the palette items and then items is set there oh we could even avoid that intermediate and what I forgot is that this palette is singular it's a canvas object but whilst we're here I think it's going to be really helpful to change that so that when uh, when our graphical editor gets more complex we have themes and widgets and all sorts of things we want to edit we can do a lot more. So instead of a generic canvas object, I'm going to return here um, tab items, uh, a list of tab items, which is going to be much more flexible. So in the user interface code, that's fix the compile errors. And then for our editors, we just need to fix this up, which is pretty straightforward because Again, we're all using this simple editor and the palette type has simply changed. So we now have palettes and that's a, a slice of um, canvas.tabitem. Yep. And then this with an S is going to return them. Oh, sorry, container. Don't know how canvas slipped in there. So that's now functioning correctly. The code editor, the sorry, the, the simple editor doesn't conform anymore. Um, that's because I changed this to a plural. So now it conforms. They're all working. All of the basic editors don't have a palette, but the graphical editor does. So this make palette here. Um, well, we could call that make theme palette, make theme palette, and let's just tidy this up a little more. Um, and just give that a slightly different name. Uh, actually, let's call it tabs. And that's a uh, container tab item slice and this was we were editing the theme first of all um, let's just go oh, in here we need a constructor new tab item theme and make the panel and we called that tabs so there we know now support multiple um, 
palettes at the same time and an editor can return multiple palettes so we could have one two three um, on the right hand panel let's just fix this up here to be plural as well to tidy that up and now the app palette is always going to be there and we will simply replace anything else with the open editors palette so the last thing there is just to make the app tab um, for the palettes. Um, let's make that make app palette really fits with the naming better. Um, pop this in here. Make app palette, and that's going to return a canvas object in this instance because the tab item is being set up here. it's on the GUI type. Okay, there we go. And now what we need to do is put in here uh, our user interface for editing the app metadata. So, I mean, the content essentially is probably just a, a form, yeah? Widget new form, and that will have Firstly, of course, we need to have the name or item name, and that will be an entry for the name input. Um, well, we could have a bunch of these things. Um, the ID of an application, which we mentioned um, a couple of episodes ago, needs to be in there uh, for the uniqueness. And we could, while we're here, set up a, a version number, I guess. And these all want to be entries. New entry for the name, uh, ID equals new entry again, and version. New entry, okay. So that's set up the form with the three fields that we want, but we need obviously to pass in the data. And that's going to um, come into here, I suppose. So let's pass in that really useful project type that we uh, created a, little, a few minutes ago. That's a um, app.project. So we can set the name text to the project meta details name and we could do just the same for ID where we're getting the details ID and version version okay so that's going to be set up for the the correct content realistically though we're going to want to do a little bit more than that we're going to want to save the data. Um, so we can use an unchanged callback for the name, but we're going to want to do the same for ID and for version as well. So we don't really want to put an inline function there. We, we really just want to call the um, save. Um, so I can define that here. Uh, save meta is an anonymous function. Um, these oh no, these expect a string to be passed in, so we can ignore that because we have access to the data there, and we're going to use the same function for three different callbacks. So let's set up the code here to um, to save it. We're going to. Um, well, we have project data, metadata here. We're going to want to update it. So that would be the um, metadata there. The details.name should then be set to the text of our name entry. Text, and the same for the other two. Oh, goodness, where did my editor go? I can't. 
Mm, keyboard shortcuts, I think, that I don't know. Uh, so the data name is the name, the ID, and the version need to be set as well. Um, goodness me, that's the wrong way around. It's the ID, the text of the ID field, um, and the text of the version field. Cool. Um, so we've updated our data structure. Now we're going to want to um, save that. So we can call the um, save function I've mentioned in passing earlier by passing it our data and the URI that we should be saving to. Uh, so we had that URI earlier. Let's see if we can pass it in here. Because um, we are calling make app palette and we are passing in oh well we haven't passed in anything yet the user interface um, creation is going to need the project and that comes from the main function make ui and actually you can see we're calling make gui a long time before we load our project. So that adds a little bit of a challenge for us, but not to worry, we'll come back to that shortly. We'll finish up the code that we're looking at here first. The app palette was being passed in the project, but we currently don't know what the project is because it hasn't been loaded. Um, that's okay. We will um, figure that out. We're going to save this um, to a place where we don't yet have the location. Um, so let's, yeah, we're going to need to load. We're going to need to load the location. Um, so the meta URI is, um, oh, let's just, copy it from hmm, the new project that we were setting up before. We're able to get that from there, and that's our metadata. Uh, actually, we just need, to, just need the URI, I think. Let's not log the error multiple times. If it uh, didn't succeed, then it didn't succeed and we need the directory. So let's not pass in the, well, we can't pass in the project. Um, we'll pass in, oh, we don't need the, don't know the directory either because that is related to the project. So we'll add a directory function to our project type, um, or we could just expose the directory. Well, let's do that for now. Um, there we are, or, yep, that's fine, jump back to here. So we've got the directory for a project, we can figure out the data URI, and for now, oh, I got it meta URI, let's, let's go with that. We're trying to save, and um, that right should be successful. Uh, if not, let's, um, shall we display an error? Yeah, probably a good thing to do if we can. We have the access to the window, so we can dialog.show error, uh, error. If, if the end error was nil, uh, not nil. So there the user has made a change, we're trying to save, and if it didn't work, they probably need to know, because that was a user initiated um, change, and uh, they're gonna be a bit upset if it doesn't work. So each time the file changes, we're going to make that save. That seems, seems sensible. Now we're left with how do we get the project into this app palette when the project hasn't been set. The answer to that 
is going to be data binding. So if we look at the, um, the user interface definition, we have set up a data binding before for the project title that's being used in various places throughout the application so we don't have to wire into when the project was loaded to read the title. But actually, we're going to want to share more than just the title. The project is really what we're looking for. So to do that, we're going to want to have a project binding. And what does one of those look like? I'm very glad you asked. We're going to use and um, extend the data binding types available to provide our own type. So in this project file, which seems like the right place to have a data binding, it's related here already. Instead of just setting the title, what we're aiming for is to um, be able to set the project. And that way we can get all of this metadata, not just the title. So how do we go about doing that? We'll set up a new type that's going to understand projects and data binding. Uh, project binding, and that's, that's a struct. And we're going to embed to get the behavior of the untitled, untyped binding. And what this means is that it's going to handle the storage of something, but it doesn't understand any types. Probably there's a way to make this a little bit nicer using generics, um, but the fine project it supports versions of Go that don't provide generics yet. So we need to work around that and build something just a little, mm, slightly less polished, I suppose, but it will work just as well. Now for a data binding, we're going to need to get and set data. So to do that, we're going to want a get and set. So a function on project binding, get. Now this is probably not going to work perfectly. Um, that should return a project when we call get, but there's going to be a name collision here because there's a get defined on untyped and we're trying to return project and app.project, sorry. And so we're going to actually need to name this slightly differently. So we'll call it get project. And this uh, is pretty straightforward. We're, we're just wanting to return the data, but with the type that we know it is. But we need to check for nil case. Error. Um, asking the untyped for the, the data that it holds. This can error, like I mentioned before, because data binding, it can chain a lot of operations um, and it's possible that conversion or, or database lookup or something would fail. So if there was an error, then we're going to just have to return nil. Otherwise, we can return our project as a project. So now we're able to access the um, data of the type that we want. And we can call a setter as well, project binding, and that would be set project. Um, project uh, app. Sorry, it's an app.project. Um, that will just um, return. Uh, we don't return, sorry, we set. The p dot set is called with our project. Strictly speaking, I suppose we could return errors here. There's a possible error, but we just don't actually care. Um, we know that this is going to succeed because we've built everything um, up uh, underneath it. So that, that could be done with confidence. So, we can now go back um, and fix up some of the some of the errors. Um, so the title here was looking to be informed when the name changed. So instead, we can say a project add listener, and the project 
get project. Well, we know that the project could be nil, so let's just check if p is nil. Let's, um, oh, actually, we have a default here. So let's set the default there, and then if the project is not nil, then we'll use the data. So name is p.meta details name. Um, oh, we're not going to bother returning an error there. The title can then be set to the name that we have extracted. So that's one uh, listener updated. Next issue. Um, ah, yes. We needed to pass the project into make app palette, but actually now we don't need to. We can access the project um, whenever, whenever it's set. Now we know that that's not going to be set when we are first called. So instead we want a load function that is going to uh, execute when the project is set. So again, we can add a listener, new data listener in line here. And we, at that point, don't need the metadata. We will access the project from um, g.project.get project. Um, it could be nil. So if that is nil, we'll just return. There's nothing more we can do. But our setup code can be moved up into this callback. So the items in the UI need to be created. Then we bind a listener to the data and Let's just call that P here. Not going to be a problem. The meta URI is something that we can look at in a second. And that's going to pass through. How do we save? So we're going to save um, when these um, change. But we don't need that to happen here um, because we're, we're setting up the data in the first place. Um, so we don't need the callback set. We'll make the changes um, and then we will set up this change listener. So we could move this setup code into our callback so we now know what project we're saving we can use the metadata like we were hoping to before. And we can figure out the URI by accessing the project directory and learning, uh, creating the child file URI. So that should be the save functions complete. I think all we need to do now is to set up the listener. Here we were setting the title to be a string binding. So we want to replace that with a new project binding, um, uh, which is a function we haven't declared. So a quick addition here, Look, new project binding, that's going to return a project binding, no surprise there, but we will uh, want to set up the untyped binding, that's just an interface value, we're going to have to give it some content, so uh, project binding and the untyped is a new untyped binding. There's no specific data in there. Well, there's no type, there's no data. It's all quite, I was about to say generic, general, unknown. Um, and then here we can set a listener once again on the project. Get the project from the thing we have listened to. Use the type version and if p is not nil then we can simply use the uh, 
metadata at p dot details dot name. I think that is everything. Let's have a quick look. I might have missed one or two items. Obviously, I missed one or two items. Um, the interface, right, so we've missed a nil check. We can't do a type conversion on the nil. Now, I thought I had caught that one, but it's at 165. If the error is not nil, ah, right, so if the error is not nil, that's one issue. But if the project is nil, then we're also going to have to return nil. Um, that was uh, proj, not project. So that should complete the nil check for the get version of our call. So we will open that example project once again. And we can see the example headers are functioning as before. And we have managed to get this data binding into our app editor, which is nicely appearing. If I set up a, an example here, app dot example, then that should have saved directly. And if I, um, well, we can we can test the file save with that as well. But now we have these app tabs. When we open our user interface, it has in fact added them onto the end there, which is great. However, we've added a tab item. It would be nice to select it. So before we go in and check if the file save was all functional, let's just fix that there. So when we were accessing the palette, we've appended them here. Uh, so let's just do a quick, um, quick check if g.palette.items, um, if the length of them is greater than one, then we want to select, um, oops, wrong place for the bracket there. Let's just select the, the second one along, the one with ID one, um, index, sorry, the one with index one. So running the same code again with that minor change, we'll open our project and we can see the file did save, excellent. We don't have change indicators up here, might choose to add them later, but it is clearly working and the um, header updated. We could actually make that slightly slicker, let's come back to that in a second. Um, and when we open something with multiple palettes, there you go, it is selecting the palette that the editor defines. So coming back to what happens when we change the app data, we've made the change here, we've written it out to file. So if the um, if there was no error, uh, then what we can do, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you want to or not, but we know there's new data, so we can load it and, um, and then set the binding to the new data. So if we load the data that we saved, um, new project from the directory, we know it is saved in, then we can uh, go to the GUI's project binding and set the project to this value that we have just loaded. And so if we go through, um, open the example project again, we have example as we saved, and then by setting two, you can see across the board, it has updated to the new project title. So that's the, the data binding, basically going all the way around. We're making a change um, from something we've read, putting it back into the system, and everything is updating accordingly. But of course, this was actually all just to make it possible to do a little bit more with the metadata of projects. And the recent projects is what I wanted to work on. So if I just create a new file uh, called recents, I will put some, some cool functionality in here. That is a package main still. We're going to want to uh, add a favorite and list the favorites, I would think. Uh, recents, sorry. That will be for a project, I'm guessing. 
no app dot project. Yep. And then list recent would return a slice of app projects, I suppose. So we want to flesh these out and then make use of the project listing. Um, recent project listing, sorry. And um, we're going to want to uh, store them as well. Yeah, so actually we're going to make use of uh, the um, preferences that uh, I mentioned in passing in an earlier episode, but the preferences provides us a place that um, preferences uh, provides us a place that we can store user metadata essentially. Um, so we can use that to store our projects um, for yeah for future for future reference. Um, we're going to want uh, to store the URI that the project came from, but also the human readable name. So we don't have to read um, the metadata file every time we're, we're looking at it. So in fact, let's just quickly define um, a new type um, called recent that holds the name of the project that we previously parsed and the directory that we found it in. So those are the pair of things that we're going to store. Um, and let's just let's just see if we can um, flesh these out. When we're adding a recent, uh, let's just pop it at the at the beginning of the list for now. There's some subtlety about um, you know not duplicating and bringing them up to the top and so forth. But let's let's skip over that. So the adding is a new recent uh, recent of name is project.meta.detail.name um, and the directory is the directory from the project projects there. Um, oh, I forgot the specifier. So that's the one that we want to add. Um, the list um, list of preferences, preferences, recents, um, is something that we're going to need to load. Actually, we I defined that method already, I suppose. Um, so the complete list would be, um, if we want the newest at the top, then make that a list of recents that comprises this new one, and append to that all of the others. And actually this type would be of um, recent, not of app project. Um, append has a, oh, what's going on? I think that's everything that we need. Um, and then we would just need to um, The right, uh, right. The recents. Um, just all. Um, oh, and the preferences. Listing them is going to be um, a case of accessing them from the preferences um, and repopulating them. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so um, we have the, so recent preferences has the concept of lists. It can store string lists and so forth. But what we have really is a list of multiple items, a struct list, I suppose, or slice. It doesn't really have support for that. So we're going to do something a little bit, um, a little bit more manual, um, and instead reference um, create the create the format ourselves. So when we're loading them, we're going to ask first how many, how many there are, um, and it's going to pass in 
the preferences that we're using. So we can say preferences.int um, and that will be recent dot count, um, I suppose, oh, just recent count. That will work. So we'll get them back a number um, and we can return um, an appropriate sized response. So make um, a slice of recents of that size. And then for um, each integer um, between uh, this and that, oh, the new new range on integer um, feature is going to be nice uh, when, when it does land. Uh, I have less than counts, I plus plus. We're going to want to load each one of them and set it into that um, index and then return. So how do we set one up for each of these? Adding is another um, recent with a name and a directory. So where do we get this information? Well, we use the preferences again, um, but we're going to look for um, a string to look up the key. The string is going to be recent dot and then the integer, so that we're storing um, the metadata for each of them, both fields. Um, so we're going to have a prefix that's some, um, consistent. Let's set up that with a printf format. Printf, and that's going to be of the format matching what we used above, recent dot, and then an integer um, with another dot, and then we'll use the field. The integer being passed in is i. Um, okay, so that's the string format. So the key is then the parent plus um, name, and that's going to be the name for our new item loaded. The directory um, is it's the URI actually. Um, so we need to do a little conversion here. Um, so storage parse the URI from the string. And this could this could error. I mean we don't know what's in that string format, so if the error is not nil, um, let's let's log that. Log the error. Um, and move on. Let's not bother creating that. And the directory is is you right? The U field there. Uh, oh, not quite. It needs to be listable, doesn't it? So we have one more, one more item of conversion to do. Let's just say that we're confident uh, in this conversion. Lister for URI, and now we have the directory we needed. Um, so we can load the recents, um, and then we're going to want to write the recents as well. Right, recent. So that's going to take a slice of recents, and um, again, I find preferences that allows us uh, to know uh, the storage. You'll see where that comes from um, in just a moment. It's it's part of the app. It's all bundled in. Um, we just uh, passing it around is nicer than the find dot current app dot preferences like we did for the window lookup earlier, which just feels a little bit messy. Um, thankfully, writing them is is just a little bit easier. Um, we need to um, essentially do the equivalent, but in reverse. So we want to set the recent count. So this time we call set int, and for recent dot count, we set um, the length of the list, and then for each item in that list, um, we do want the index and we want the recent item range list. Then <clears throat> we're going to, I suppose we want this key again. Let's just take that out of there, pop it in here. 
So we've got recent dot i, and then much like before, we're going to p dot set string, and that will be parent plus name. I will pass in the uh, recent name, and then for the uri, set string parent plus uri and that will be the directory but we can use this little string conversion here to pass it all the way in so that will write the recent so we've got lists we've got add add is going to write them so our entry is, is to add it or to list um, there seems seems to be an error what have I missed oh yeah it didn't pass in the preferences there. Okay, so our preferences code should be fine. The error is nobody's using it. So we can go ahead and fix that. Um, firstly, when we open a project, we're going to want to add that to the recents. So open project. Um, oh, I didn't go back and tidy it. That. We don't need that title anymore. And that's loaded the project, set it there. We could at this point um, add recent, and that's the P project and the preferences for the app. Um, and having said that I wouldn't get it from the current app, um, I'm going to do just that right now. Sorry. Uh, if we're passing around the app in the GUI, project we could avoid that but it will be fine for now. I might come back to that after the video. So now we are adding the recent project, um, the project we opened into the list of recent projects. That's great. Where do we use this information? Well the most obvious place would be on our launch wizard. So let's go back to um, where we where we did actually create our wizard um, show ah yes here show create so we have an open project button and a create project button well just for now let's between these squeeze in a recent project button so uh, that would be widget new button recent projects Um, and when we call that uh, callback, what we want to do is push an item into the wizard, um, push like all of the others, but this time we will pass in um, the user interface for um, listing recent projects. Uh, we're going to want, I suppose, oh, not size wizard, um, to mimic this make create detail. Um, so let's just add a new one there, make recent. And we want to return the list of all the items um, yeah, that we found in the recent project. Uh, so let's, um, I suppose, first figure out what that list is. Um, list recents and work again I'm going to pass in the current apps preferences provider and then actually just return a new list uh, with the three appropriate callbacks um, the first one is the length callback so return um, the length of items cool then next is Oh. the canvas object for creating an item in the recent so that would be I guess a, a button yeah we want a, a list of buttons and that's going to be for a recent uh, project this is just the template function so this won't be displayed we just um, need to uh, set it up with for spacing. And then the last function um, is the one that passed in the list item ID. 
and the object that we've to uh, update that's been pulled out of the cache. Uh, that should have been a return. That error goes away. And here we know that our object is a button, so that's a widget dot button. We're going to want to set the text of that to be items I name. So that's the name of the project we've loaded from the recents. Um, <clears throat> but also we need to figure out what happens when the button is tapped so that it opens the right project. So in here, we're going to want to um, open the project. Well, that's pretty straightforward because our recent items has a directory there, which is already a listable URI. But we also want to close this wizard, um, which is currently visible. How did I do that before? Um, ah, just a widget, so we can hide it. A dialog, sorry. So we hide the wizard, we open the project, and that um, should be that. Wish me luck as we run. Um, recent isn't declared. Uh, okay. What did I miss? What did I miss? Ah, it is declared, but it's not used. So we have open and create being passed in as buttons here. Let's have a grid with three buttons and put recent in the middle. Thank you, Go, for catching that obvious error. And here is our recent button. And there's no recent projects. I think that's probably to be expected. So let's open up our example project. Um, we have everything as it was before. And let's just, let's just quit out of here and open it up again because that's the, the only place that our recent projects are. And we have our example recent project here. Fantastic. Oh, well, that's, that's, really, that's really pulled that together. So now each time we load the UI, we can get to a project that was recently there. Um, but I thought it could be really interesting to just put the recents in one more place because we have a menu as well. We have save, we have open project, but we could also add recent projects. I think that would be pretty helpful. So to do that, we're going to want to create a menu um, that has a sub menu in it. Um, so let's just um, make a new menu item. Um, new menu um, item. So this is the, the uh, child that will be inserted. And that's going to open a dialog. So we put three dots there. Um, it's not going to have an action itself. And we can insert that into here. But how we set up the item to pop out is to say child menu and pass that a new menu. Obviously, that's probably recent as well. Um, but uh, it most likely won't be displayed because it's a, a sub menu. And then for each of those items, we need to. Um, recent items, we need to, to populate that list. So um, that would be uh, e, let me think, sorry, the preference items um, we, we would get from list recents. And here we are, um, where's the name menu called? I think we could pass in make menu. Yeah, we could pass in our application and dot preferences here. That would be that would be nice just to pass it uh, pass it around once. So you can see what I mean. We can pass the preferences in here, and we can use them. That is going to load them from the preference storage, and uh, then we need to make our menu items. Um, so recent items, let's just, uh, well, for efficiency's sake, we can make a new slice of menu items. And that would be of length recents. 
and then for each um, item in the recents uh, input, we want to set recent items at that index to be a new menu item with the name of the recent and a function that would open it um, when we click. So we can just use um, open project here and pass in the directory. Yeah, I think that's right. The recent items um, is, oh, slightly wrong type. I think that's um, a pointer of menu items and that's returning a pointer. So we've created recent projects, set it in as a menu that's passed into the main menu. So with any luck, what we should see is a menu item here, recent projects, with the items that we've recently added. And as you can see, there's duplicates, like I mentioned in the past. We'll need to do a little bit of filtering to make sure that it's not entered twice, but also when you open a project, it probably wants to go to the top of the list. And we probably also want to limit it to a certain number of items. I don't think we need to worry about those things just here, uh, but we'll update them in the code uh, between videos and you'll, you'll be able to see how that is, is going to tidy this little piece of work up um, and improve the workflow for frequently opening the same project type. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully that was really useful, um, seeing how we can work with various different file types. We're updated to have multiple palettes here on the right, so there's a lot more that we can add into the application. It's going to be quicker to get started editing items that we have previously been working with uh, recently through the recent code. I think I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, of course, that is probably the best way to work with um, custom types in data binding. So hopefully that has been useful as well. I think really the, the only major gap um, left for our first version here is how can we actually work with these widgets on the screen and edit the user interface that we're previewing. So please do consider coming back next week when we're going to be working through those changes. And don't forget, if you're interested in the project that we're putting together here, you can find out more at fission.app. Head to the website, see what the latest is, um, uh, sign up for um, the waiting list or help us to prioritize or if you're if you're really interested in providing feedback of what we've done so far that would be really helpful and do subscribe to this channel for future videos but of course don't forget if you can um, head along to FineConf which is going to be so Friday November the 3rd um, online and in person but of course those videos will be available later as well thanks so much for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you in episode 10 next week when we'll work on that widget editing. Bye.